tales for dark nights. The following program is a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs and become a patron today to show your support and get instant access to our extensive archive of downloadable ad-free tales of terror. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. The following program is intended for mature audiences and may contain strong language, adult themes, and content of a violent and sexual nature which may not be appropriate for everyone. Welcome, listener, to the Horror Hill. If it's the darkness you seek, you won't be disappointed. I'm your host, Jason Hill, and it's time for our appointment. In this place, there is no sun, and nightmares do come true. Here, instead of shadow falling, the shadows follow you. Consider getting comfortable before the air grows colder. Prepare yourself. If you dare, come inch a little closer. If darkness is what you're after, seek no more your searches through. You haven't found the darkness, traveler. The darkness has found you. Welcome back. We have two stories for you this evening. Our first, a little eye-opener for you weary night owls out there who, above all else, can appreciate the importance of a balanced breakfast. From author Scott Emerson, I give you the most important miracle. This morning I put ground glass in my wife's pancakes. I can't really say what prompted me to do it. I was behind the counter preparing a fresh bowl of batter for the early morning rush when the notion came. Then, without a second thought, I dropped a glass onto the floor and stamped my heel onto the milk-clouded shards until they were crushed fine. Then, I carefully scooped the glass into my hand and spilled it into the batter. Like I said, no reason, just a spur-of-the-moment decision, like choosing a red shirt over a blue one. All I know for sure was that it was the right thing to do. I went about my business, cooking up orders as they came down the line. The glass started batter, waiting for when Sally would come and join me for breakfast. In fact, I'd forgotten all about the batter and its contents until the old man stumbled into the diner. Through the service window, I saw him enter, steadying himself against the booths as he weaved toward the counter. He moved like he'd been drinking, or perhaps involved in some sort of accident. Jostling a few of the patrons as he went, nobody seemed to mind or even notice him, even as he spilled their coffee or knocked utensils out of their hands. Once he reached the Formica countertop, he ran a hand through his long white hair. Kelly, the morning shift waitress, walked by without a word, not being rude. She dealt with far less savory characters than him. She simply hadn't seen him standing before her. The old man took a biscuit off a plate and bit into it, crumbs gathering in his flowing white beard. He washed it down with a half-empty glass of juice someone had left behind and sauntered behind the counter into the kitchen. I didn't say anything, just kept on scrambling eggs and tossing bacon on the griddle. The old man watched me for a minute before he spoke. I know what you did, he said. Oh, how's that? The pancake batter, he said, 
Very sneaky. And clever. Almost. I'm sorry, I, I don't follow you. The old man smiled. He stuck a finger into the batter bowl and swirled it around, plucking free a sliver of glass. It glistened in the fluorescent lighting like a cheap ring. It was then I remembered breaking the glass, and remembered my wife. Hey, look, pal. I know how it seems, but I swear to... The old man waved me off. No, no, you don't understand, he said. You've nothing to worry about. I approve. I don't quite follow you. He smiled again, leered, really, in a way that was almost obscene. It's an offering, my son, to the god of breakfast. This morning he is risen and has called home his flock. Those that have answered, they shall be rewarded in breakfast heaven. He wrapped his arms around me and drew me into the warmest, most welcoming embrace I've ever known. His beard smelled of butter and maple syrup. I thought of my grandmother's dining room, her liver-spotted hands smearing orange marmalade over English muffins. You are pure of heart, my son. Rejoice, you're not alone. The god of breakfast loves you. Words failed me. I cried into the old man's beard. There, there, my son. You've still much work to do. What is it that you ask of me? The old man cradled my face in his bacon-scented hands. I'll be sending someone very soon. You'll know what to do. How? How will I know what to do? It will be just like the glass. You will know when the moment is right. And like that he was gone. The smell of butter and syrup lingering behind like a ghost. His absence felt like dying. I'd have given anything to be back in his warm, fragrant embrace. I went back to work. Although deeply missing the old man, I found a renewed vigor in myself. I heaped sausage links and stacks of pancakes onto plates with great elan, barely containing my joy as order after order came in. I wanted to sing, to tell all the diners the good news, but I kept my rapture in check. There would be time for all of that later, and when that moment came, they too would know. All the while, the batter for my wife's pancakes sat waiting. Lost in my bliss, I almost didn't hear the back door creak open. It wasn't until I heard the soft patter of footsteps on tile that I stopped and turned to see. Before me stood a young man in his early thirties, healthy and glowing, with the same luxuriant beard and mane of hair as the old man's. Only his was a rich, gleaming brown. His eyes were the same as the old man's too, as was the familiar breakfast that subtly wafted from his being. The young man smiled beatifically. My father sent me, he said. He told me that you would know what to do. And in that moment, I did. I picked up the meat cleaver and got down to it. First, I cut into his chest, hacking away at the thick layers of bacon beneath the skin. Grease oozed in wet spatters as I shaved meat away from the bone, gathering it onto a plate for later frying. Next, I pried open the young man's ribcage to get the plump, round ham beating there, nearly dropping at my ecstatic state. His midsection came next. Yard after yard of sausage links unspooling as I pulled them free like a magician's handkerchiefs, slippery and warm. I hacked open his skull and scooped several helpings of hash browns, slit his throat like a slaughterhouse steer, and stuck a carafe underneath the gouting wound to collect the orange juice that flowed forth. Grabbing his testicles, I squeezed until they cracked like eggshells, the yolks spewing forth to land, spitting on the griddle. I reached for a spatula and commenced scrambling. 
Finally, I cut the young man's tongue from his mouth, rolled it in breadcrumbs, and tossed it in the deep fryer. This last bit I ate myself, for it, above all else, carried the word of the god of breakfast. Renewed, I spent the rest of the morning cooking the young man's bounty. From the kitchen, I announced all meals were on the house, and a chorus of approval rose from the diners. The bell above the door jangled as my wife came in. I caught her eye, and she smiled on the way to her booth in the corner. I took the bowl of glass-spiked batter and proceeded to pour out pancakes. In the service window waited row after row of plates, each piled high with food harvested from my young visitor. Fish hooks wrapped in bacon, razor blade nestled in Belgian waffles, thumbtacks swirled in a soiled toilet and hidden in French toast, eggs benedict dusted with bug spray, glasses of milk and orange juice laced with rat poison. I thought of all the diners in greasy spoons across this great country of ours, the cooks preparing offerings of their own, of folks sitting down to their own specially prepared meals. I thought of the god of breakfast, looking down with his warm, loving gaze. I thought of what was to come. It was all I could do not to weep with joy. I carried a stack of pancakes to my wife. As I placed them in front of her, she greeted me with a peck on the cheek. Hi, honey, she said. Busy morning? Oh, yes. But a good one. Oh, I'm glad. She poured maple syrup over her pancakes, slowly, drawing out my anticipation. Then, she picked up her fork, cut herself a morsel, and took the first bite of a new age. Still curious to see how the sausage gets made on the Horror Hill? I didn't think so. Our second story tonight offers an indulgence in fearful fan service. So be sure to snuggle up warm in your remote cabin in the woods, and join me and the Horror Hill community as we... Hail to the King. From author Krista Carmen, I give you The Girl Who Loved Bruce Campbell. No bottom pond might have had a bottom, but as far as the three clammy and restless individuals that sat in the idling car by its banks knew, it very well might not. The cold sweats and body aches would not assail them for much longer. The lankier of the two males divvied up the wax baggies of brown powder, and each in turn began their own sacred ritual of preparation. It took only seconds for the first of the three to realize a key element was missing from their assorted paraphernalia. Damn, the stocky male said. Does, um, does anyone have a water bottle? There was no reply as each of the three checked the space around their feet in the nearest cup holder. Oh, now what? The lone female asked. We can't hit a gas station. We need to stay off the roads for a while. Someone may have seen us leave that house. There was murmured agreement from the two men, followed by a morose silence. The lanky man broke the quiet with a snort of derision. This shit's fried our brains, he said. They were sitting next to a lake complaining about not having any water to shoot up with. It's not a lake, it's a pond, the woman said. Technically, it's not even a pond, it's an estuary, and we can't use the water because it's brackish. The stouter man sounded matter-of-fact. What's brackish mean? That it's dirty? Oh, please, I've seen you use water from the tank of a gas station toilet. Dirty should be the least of your worries. This from the woman. No, not dirty, brackish. It means it's half fresh water, half salt. We can't shoot that. It might mess with our body's electrolytes or something. Now the stocky man sounded less sure of himself. The lanky man opened the car door. 
He reached for an empty Dunkin' Donuts cup discarded on the floor of the passenger seat, removed the lid, and looked suspiciously into its depths. Shrugging, he started for the pond's weedy shore. I didn't get away with a B&E and buy dope from the shadiest dealer in town to let a little salt water stop me. It's only half salt, anyway, he called over his shoulder. The woman with a stout man watched him creep toward the water's edge. He folded his tall frame in half and scooped a cupful of water into the styrofoam. He did this in the light of a moon so close it seemed to be perched atop the hill that loomed over No Bottom Pond, a luminous cherry bedecking a black forest cake. The first full moon to rise on Christmas in forty years had occurred the night before. A Christmas miracle, the woman had said sarcastically as they listened to a radio talk show host lament the previous night's fog cover on their way to Shore Road and the house they'd been casing most of the past week. The upscale home had yielded extensive reserves of jewelry, cash, and three guns. There'd been safe, but they had no use for a safe. They only took what they could trade quickly and easily to their dealer, and their dealer had no interest in safes. The lunar display of December 26th happened to be free from a smothering blanket of fog. As the woman watched the tall man return, she noticed that in the bright moonlight, the water's surface had a strange sparkle to it. It was almost phosphorescent in the gleam. Parts of the pond were the shiny, black oil slick of water and moonlight she'd expect. Having spent her whole life in the seaside town, she'd seen water undulating under the moon enough times for the sight to be commonplace, but... No Bottom Pond was greenish in its radiance, and did not steam so much as gurgle, like the stew in a witch's cauldron. She forgot her inquisitiveness over the appearance of the water when the passenger door slammed shut. Three syringe tips plunged greedily into the captured pond water, transporting water from cup to three waiting spoons. Mysticism, Rhode Island, was a small town, and the population was reduced by half in the winter. The heroin dealers had been tapped into the same pipelines in and out of the closest major cities for decades. The three long-time users expected the same cut and purity of dope they'd had on the previous day, and on the occasion of their first use. Subsequently, no lighter flicked on to form dancing shadows on the car walls. No butane-fueled flame burned prospective toxins out of the contents of their spoons. They each shot up. One, two, three. And each fell into the first nod of euphoria, a scarecrow short of Dorothy and her comrades in the poppy field. At the same time that legions of fish were rising to the vaporous surface of No Bottom Pond, dead and already beginning to putrefy, Small boils began to pop up under the skin of the three beings in the car. The tall man thought he'd injected a hot shot, while the woman jerked out of her nod in wild agitation to inspect the tip of her needle, convinced she'd given herself cotton fever by neglecting to free the point from Q-tip remnants. Both of them were wrong. The mutations occurred quickly, and the changes were profound. When the transformation was complete, the three beings were no longer satisfied with the heroin that flowed through their veins. They were hungry. Hungry in a way that made every torturous withdrawal symptom or harrowing mental craving of the past seem like a petty annoyance. A minor itch that could go without being scratched. Two hours earlier, a local scientist named Craig Silas stood on a dip of Watch Hill Road, a dark silhouette overlooking the river that rushed into No Bottom Pond. Craig worked at a nearby pharmaceutical company, and the previous year had snuck a project home to his basement laboratory to continue his work free from the oversight and ethical regulations of his employer. In the wake of a countrywide opiate epidemic... Big Pharma had sufficient incentive to develop an opioid-free painkiller, eliminating the potential for abuse and addiction. 
Craig had stumbled on an unanticipated side effect of the chemical compound he'd been studying, and upon bringing his research home, further unlocked the potential of the drug. Characteristics included superhuman strength, laser point focus, and a complete inability to feel pain. Craig spent weeks hypothesizing on the drug's limitless prospects until he descended the basement stairs one morning to find one of the pink-eyed lab rats feasting on his cage mate's brains. With every possibility of experiencing pain eliminated, the rat's behavior had morphed into something much more ominous and much more deadly. After driving up and down the streets of mysticism with the concoction swishing around a large vat in his trunk, Craig noticed that the adjacent river ran beneath the road and into a wide inlet. Theorizing that the body of water before him was the equivalent of a dead-end street, he pulled onto the narrow shoulder and muscled the vat onto the guardrail before another car could appear. Craig Silas had left No Bottom Pond ten miles behind him by the time his miracle drug had seeped into the pond's ecosystem, and was home in his favorite armchair with his feet up by the time the first transformations began to occur. Sophisticated cognition already reduced to animalistic compulsion, the three addicts, who had become fiends of an entirely different nature, were barely able to recall the chain of events that had led them to their last high, brought to the utmost intensity by the unorthodox mixture of heroin and pond-dispersed opiate-free analgesic. But they were able to recall enough to know what they needed to do to feed the hunger that gnawed at their insides like so many of Silas's lab rats. And so, they began to move. Cartier watched the spray of blood waterfall through the front door of the cabin and grabbed Kit's arm. That was awesome, she cheered, the arm grabbing escalating to arm slapping. She turned to face her boyfriend. How much time is left? Car, just watch. I'm not messing around with it again. It's 30 minutes long like all the other episodes. This appeased Cardi enough to watch the last 10 minutes in silence. She twirled a ringlet of cherry coke colored hair around blood red fingernails. When the show was over, she turned to Kit again, eager to hear his opinion on the latest installment. Well, Kit said, they uh, definitely set us up for an epic showdown at the cabin. Agreed. I wish there was more than ten episodes. That was a good one, though. Buckets of blood. Twisted, gory, and hilarious, Kit said. That dead cop put her fist through the camper's skulls and turned them into corpse puppets. Let's be serious. Most of the other characters only exist to compliment Ash, to give the directors a springboard for his one-liners and so that we can see some different weapons brandished against the deadites. It can't all be about Ash's chainsaw arm and boomstick. She mimed, obliterating Kit with a shotgun blast to the face. Also, she continued, did I tell you that Ash, um, I mean, <laughs> sorry, Bruce Campbell wrote an autobiography a few years back called If Chins Could Kill? Kit gave her a look that conveyed both incredulity and reverence and broke into a hearty chuckle, no doubt visualizing the B-list movie actor's signature square chin. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. You need to get that book. He gestured to the two bookshelves flanking the television, which still rolled the blood-splattered credits for the show. Cardia nodded with enthusiasm, but did not turn to regard the bookshelves, pointing instead to the two vinyl pop characters facing off from their respective posts atop surround sound speakers. The plastic ash and army of darkness deadite had been Christmas gifts from her mother the previous morning. Though she didn't share her daughter's love for horror, Cardia's mother knew Cardia and Kid harbored a cultish enthusiasm for ash and all things Evil Dead, from the campy originals to the 2013 remake, and now the television series. She had wrapped the figurines knowing it would bring appreciative smiles to their faces. Instead of that speaker, a hardcover copy of If Chins Could Kill could be Mini Ash's battleground to fight against evil, Cardia said. Kit smiled and got to his feet. You're cute, babe. I love that you love blood and guts as much as I do. 
Kit stretched his six-foot-three frame toward the ceiling and let out a groan. But the party's over. I have to get to work. I can't believe you agreed to work the night after Christmas. She tried to pout, but a yawn claimed her features instead. Although, to be honest, you won't miss much. I'm beat. I'll be asleep in about 15 minutes after you leave anyway. As Kit dragged himself up the stairs to change, Cardia heard a muffled chime and realized she was sitting on her phone. A preview of the text message scrolled across her screen. Cardia's friend Laura had written, Better lock your door, it read. Laura did well as an emergency room nurse, working as an independent contractor in different hospitals from Hartford to Boston. She vacationed often and had returned that morning from her fourth trip to St. John since the year began. Cardia thumbed at the screen until she could see the rest of the message. In its entirety, it read, Better lock your door, because my house got broken into. A fat worm of fear speared itself between the layers of Cardia's intestines. There had been numerous reports of break-ins and mysticism over the last month, and Laura lived less than a mile from the riverfront home Cardia and Kit rented. Her fingers jerking in furious spasms, Cardia texted Laura back. Were you home? Are you okay? What did they take? As she waited for Laura's reply, Kit trudged back down the stairs. He was able to read the worry on her face with a single glance. What is it? Laura and Seth's house got broken into. I asked her what they took and if they were home. She hasn't answered me yet. The concern on Kit's face mixed with anger. With a grim headshake, he reached out to pull her off the couch. (sighs) This isn't happening. No way they switched me to the night shift a month before the worst string of burglaries this town has ever seen. Follow me. Why? Where are we going? Cardia's attention was split between the grip on her forearm and her phone announcing a newly arrived message. Kit gestured up the stairs but let go of her so she could navigate her text app. She read silently, her brow creased, then raised her eyes to meet Kit's. She said they were out getting drinks and they came home to a broken window in the living room. They'd been on vacation for the past week so someone obviously anticipated an empty house. They took jewelry, cash, some other valuables. Cardia tried to trail off effectively, as if this was the extent of stolen goods. And? What else? When she didn't answer, he said. What else did they take, Cardia? Three guns were missing, she said, knowing this information would fan Kit's anger and apprehension into a full-blown blaze. Motivated anew, Kit took her hand and resumed their ascent. In the guest bedroom, he retrieved a lockbox from an opaque-fronted entertainment stand. I would never forgive myself if something happened to you. I know you're going to protest, but just agree to it for my sake. He pulled a handgun from the box and spun the chamber, counting bullets. Um, Kit... Cartier objected. Please, just come here so I can give you a quick refresher on how to... Kit. She was about to insist on an end to this ridiculous conversation. Instead, Cartier sighed and took the gun from Kit's hands, showing him that she remembered how to wield the weapon properly, cocking the hammer and adopting a shooter's stance. You've dragged me to the range a hundred times. I know what I'm doing well enough to defend myself if it came to it. Kit nodded but was distracted. She cleared the chamber and handed the gun back to Kit. Spinning on her heel for the hall, she stopped short when she heard the scrape of something much larger being unearthed from the closet. Without turning, she said, Kit, I do not need the shotgun to be within arm's reach when I'm going to bed tonight. Torn between Cartier's obvious intention to refuse the shotgun and his need to be assured of her safety, Kit placed the shotgun on top of the stand. Fine, he said, but I'm leaving it here just in case. The revolver is going on your nightstand and that's not open for discussion. Oh, fine, Cartier said. 
Her belief that the house was impregnable, that the probability of burglars targeting their quiet one-acre lot over any other in town, was causing her to grow bored with the conversation. Drive safe, please, and try to have a good night at work. Cardia let Kit lead her into their bedroom, saying nothing as he placed the revolver on a paperback two feet from where she was to lay her head upon the pillow. He kissed her goodnight and turned off the bedside lamp. Cardia listened to his footsteps on the stairs as she nestled beneath the covers. She had overblown her prediction after all. It took far less than 15 minutes after Kit's departure for Cardia to fall asleep. A noise woke her. What sounded like the skeletal finger of a winter dead tree tapping on a window. She sat up, disoriented. Had Kit forgotten something? Perhaps his badge? Or the food he'd packed to eat in his break? She groped for her cell, found the button to illuminate the screen. 10.45. Kit would be 45 minutes into an hour-long commute, so it wouldn't be him tapping. She strained to catch the sound again, but it had stopped. Cartia sunk down onto the pillow, drawing the comforter up to her neck, and then groaned. She flung the comforter back, forcing herself to bear the cold trek to the bathroom before returning to sleep. Halfway there, the tapping began again. Cardia froze. There, in the hallway... Equally removed from both the revolver and the shotgun Kit had set out for her protection, vulnerable in her bare feet, with full bladder and panic fluttering in her brain like a moth inside a lantern, the details of the nearby break-in came roaring back, having been temporarily stolen by the fugue of sleep. Rooted in paralysis... Her rational mind attempted to quell her fears, shuffling through a series of scenarios from the ever-popular Home Alone with an Overactive Imagination script. Oh, it's nothing. It's just the wind. Must be the house settling. There is a perfectly reasonable explanation for this. Grasping at these possibilities with the same tenacity as a drowning swimmer flailing for a rescue buoy... She started down the stairs in the dark. Cardia's bare feet sunk into the shag carpet as she crossed the living room to the big picture window on the right. Cursing the peaks and gables of the roofline for preventing the moon from aiding her in her endeavor, she changed direction, moving from the window to the front door, whacking her hip in the corner of the heavy oak desk along the way, and switched on the outdoor floodlights. Giving the desk a wider berth... She crept back to the right, so focused on the great free expanse of the window that she did not see the shadow stretched across the ground in front of her. The Kandarian demon must have possessed a hapless civilian and turned them into a deadite. At least, this was the only explanation that occurred to Cardio when she came face to face with the diseased-looking monstrosity separated from her by only half an inch of glass. For one breathless moment, Cardia thought she was dreaming. Or, perhaps, had slipped on the stairs and knocked herself out, and was now suffering some trauma-induced hallucination. The demon thing cocked its head to one side, emitted a guttural chuffing noise, and Cardia knew that somehow what she was seeing was real. She might have stood staring into the black pits of the creature's eyes, A creature who had once been a tall, lanky human man, until Kit returned home from work the next morning. But the now inhuman thing's arm shot out as if from a cannon, breaking the spell and smashing through the six-foot-tall window pane with no more effort than a man punching through paper. Cardia did not think, not in any conscious, deliberate manner. She ran to the stairs on reflex, sprinting up them two at a time, her body knowing where it was taking her, seeing her destination in her mind as clearly as an earlier scene from Evil Dead. Though it defied logic, though an hour ago it had been impossible, she had to get to the revolver if she wanted to survive. 
As she flew down the hall for the bedroom, she had the wherewithal to dart her arm into the bathroom and flip the switch. The overhead fixture bright enough to allow a half moon of light to spill into the hallway. It took all of Cardia's willpower not to shut and lock the bedroom door behind her, but knowing how easily the thing had infiltrated the ground floor, it would behoove her to leave the door open and see it coming. She grabbed the gun from the nightstand and slid along the front wall of the bedroom, flicking off the safety. She molded her hands around the butt in what she hoped was a relaxed position, remembering the words of the range attendant, Never choke your gun. That's a surefire way to hit everything but your target. Thinking this, she crouched by the closet, the thinnest rectangle of hallway visible from her spot on the floor. The sound of footsteps shuffle-dragging up the stairs after her was interrupted by a second downstairs window imploding, and then, horribly, a third. Cardia wanted to curse. She wanted to scream or cry or curl up in the fetal position. Instead, she pulled the hammer back, prayed for consistency, squinted one eye, and kept utterly silent. The thing made it to the top of the stairs and turned the corner. The hallway was short, and Cardia had a clear shot, but she held fire. The thing took a long, lumbering step, then another. It wore jeans and a plaid flannel shirt with the sleeves rolled up, and as it stepped into the crescent of light filtering from the bedroom, Cardia saw strange marks on its forearms. The thing moved forward again. The first shot shocked Cardia in its loudness, and she realized she'd never experienced gunfire firsthand without protective earmuffs. She recovered quickly, concentrating on readying a second shot despite the knowledge that the thing hadn't been halted or even slowed in its pursuit. She'd hit it three inches below the chest, a mark devoid of any major organs. Cardia hoped this was the only reason why the creature was still in its feet, but she had a sneaking suspicion that there was something more sinister spurring the demon forward. Cardia hit the creature again, in the shoulder, and again, clipping its neck, spurts of blood exploding from the torn flesh, and again, another shot to the stomach. Still, it stalked toward her. Cardia took a deep breath and held it, steadying her hands and her gaze, and aimed for its right kneecap. She hit dead center. The thing's leg folded backward threatening to topple the creature ass over tea kettle, but it would not go down. Before it could right itself, she aimed for the left kneecap. Another direct hit, and when the thing's jeans tore and the knee shattered, Cardia saw a substantial fragment of bone go catapulting through the air like a haphazardly thrown frisbee. Again, the creature stayed on its feet. Kit had considered the possibility of a break-in serious enough to warrant planting the revolver by her bedside, but not serious enough to provide her with extra bullets. The thing swayed like a drunken sorority girl in two high heels, but when it took another step, hesitant but advancing all the same, Cardia knew she had to enact Plan B. Before she could change her mind, she rushed the thing with calculated strides, coming to a stop as she reached the end of the damask-patterned runner. She bent before the creature, loath to take her eyes off it for even a moment, and took the corner of the rug up in her fingers. She knew she couldn't yank the runner hard enough to accomplish her end goal of toppling the creature over the banister and initiating a freefall to the ground floor below, but she hoped to knock it off its feet enough to start that process. Luck was on her side. The creature had already begun to fall off balance, so that when she yanked the runner with a throaty grunt, its back was already pressed against the banister, and the upward movement of the rug functioned to throw the creature's legs up and over its head in a graceless backflip over the railing. It fell the distance of fourteen hardwood steps and crashed to the floor below. Flipping on the hall light, Cardia leaned over and peered down. The thing had already gotten up and was placing one splintered but still operational leg onto the bottom step. You have got to be kidding me, Cardia said, 
scuttling back from the edge and heading for the guest bedroom. Cardia had only fired the shotgun on one prior occasion, and even then she'd almost passed on the opportunity, preferring to refine her technique with the handgun. Before she exited the bedroom, she slipped her still bare feet into a pair of red Victoria's Secret slippers, the left foot embroidered with the word naughty in white stitching, and the right with the word nice. It occurred to her that it would be immensely easier to fight deadites without a full bladder, so she walked to the bathroom to relieve herself, pointing the shotgun at an opening in the banister rails as she did, counting herself lucky when she heard what sounded like a scuffle amongst the creatures at the bottom of the stairs, delaying their climb. She declined to flush, not sure if the noise would send their zombie-like brains into a frenzy, and stood at the threshold of the passage to the stairs. What would Ash do? She thought. She looked down at her feet. Time to put the naughty foot forward, she said, forcing a half grin, and stepped her left foot out into the hallway. Cardia thudded down the stairs, took in the scene below her, and cocked the shotgun. There were three creatures, as she'd guessed from the equal number of shattered windows, and they appeared more akin to Deadite than she'd have thought possible seeing as she wasn't on set for a taping of Ash versus the Evil Dead. They were undeterred by pain, but incapable of reason, and they weren't able to begin their onslaught on the second floor because they couldn't decide amongst the three of them who was going to go up first. Cardia assisted them in this by blowing off the arm of the shorter, stockier man to the left, who looked down to regard the blood and sinew hanging from his shoulder with puzzled detachment. The thing to the right of the tall creature had been female in its human form. Cardia made the mistake of pulling the trigger as she moved down another step, throwing off her aim and catching the she-thing in the upper portion of the skull, blowing off the top half of its scalp, rocking the thing's head back on its neck. The head snapped back to its original position. Cardia recalled the catchphrase, the popular children's toy that refused to be bowled over. Weebles wobble, but they don't fall down. With dark amusement, she wondered if anyone had tried to knock a Weeble down with a double-barreled shotgun. Cardia told herself to focus on this next shot. She aimed for the center of the tall one's head. Boom, she said, a second before she squeezed the trigger. The shot was absolute in its devastation, the shell forging a hole in the thing's skull like the point of a pastry bag digging through a jelly-filled donut. Cardia was ecstatic to see that, with its brain dislodged and projected somewhere into her living room, the deadite thing was finally incapable of pursuit. Ah, so that's it, she thought. They don't appear human, but they can be killed as such. The Necronomicon proposed three specific ways to release a possessed soul. A live burial, bodily dismemberment, or purification by fire. Thinking that she liked her house and would rather not burn it to the ground, and that time did not permit the digging of two graves in frozen soil, Cardia recocked the shotgun. Wistfully, she pictured Ash's chainsaw hand. Bodily dismemberment would be a hell of a lot easier with her hero's weapon of choice than by the excruciatingly slow process of fortuitous shotgun hits. But beggars can't be choosers. Oblivious to the flecks of blood and brain matter peppering her body, Cardia closed the distance between her and the two evil things still standing. Needing to make it to the front door, she had to descend the stairs low enough to shoot the creatures sideways, preferably with one to the right and one to the left. Getting within arm's reach of the things was not her idea of a good time, but neither was wasting two barrels of the shotgun into anywhere but their heads. Cardia had properly determined the direction the undead things would be propelled in, but she wasn't lucky enough to replicate the angle of her shot to the taller creature's head. Though the things were knocked to the floor and well out of her path, they were reanimating quicker than she would have liked. Imitating a move she'd seen one of Ash's badass sidekicks perform, Cardia barrel-rolled across the back of the couch, vaulted over the coffee table, and grabbed the plastic Evil Dead toys from their speakers. As she charged the Deadites, she pistoned one arm back and released the action figure like a cannon. The Army of Darkness soldier's spear caught the first creature in the eye. 
Cardia lobbed mini Ash Williams and it wenched between the second creature's rot-infested open maul. Groovy! Cardia cheered as she swiped her car keys from their hook. Without looking back, she fled into the cold night in only her slippers, sweatpants, and an ash-gray t-shirt. Darkened in several places with deadite blood. Ten steps down the front walkway and the moon made a glorious reappearance, lighting Cardia's path to the garage and keeping her from tripping on a bizarre pile of items laid out at the base of the driveway. Allowing a second for curious inspection... Cardia stooped and beheld the needles, spoons, and a Dunkin' Donuts cup of what appeared to be coffee-tainted water. Crazed junkies are a science experiment gone wrong, she said as she jogged for the garage. Either way, no fucking thanks. The garage door groaned in protest as Cardia flung it open. She unlocked the jeep's doors with a terse beep, praying the noise was not enough to attract the deadites. She surveyed the driveway and as much of the yard as was possible. Nothing came for her. Hopping into the car, thinking she could be at the police station in less than five minutes, hoping this was quick enough to bring back reinforcements before the creatures could abandon her place for somewhere else, she threw the car into reverse and prepared to back up. The stout male thing and the lone female one took up the entirety of her rearview mirror. I don't think so. Cardia whispered and flooded the gas. The things disappeared under the jeep and Cardia flinched as she registered the sounds of splitting flesh and crunching bone. It sounded like someone had thrown a cantaloupe under the pavement from six stories up. And then there was quiet. Cardia sat in the driver's seat, feeling her skin slide over the leather under its coating of gore. She had time for one profound exhalation before a figure blotted out the moonlight streaming through the passenger side window. As she regarded the reanimated corpse woman with horror, the driver's door opened and Cardia was pulled from the jeep by a pair of rough hands inserted beneath her armpits. At the last second, before her legs had passed the frame of the vehicle, she found purchase and launched herself backward. The thing hit the pavement again with a wet thump, and Cardia managed to disentangle herself from its clutches. She ran for the garage, hoping to find a pair of gardening shears. Instead, her headlights illuminated a beautiful sight. Possibly the most beautiful sight she'd ever seen. She sent a silent apology for ever nagging Kit about cleaning out the garage, packed full of junk from previous tenants and sprinted for the chainsaw. She flipped the start switch and placed the saw on the dusty floor, gripping the handlebar with her left hand. Here goes everything, she said, and pulled the recoil rope like she'd seen her father, Kit, and Ash all do on numerous occasions. The saw popped, but did not start. Damn it! She watched the first of the possessed things which, after its run-in with her jeep, had lost even a passing resemblance to a living human, approached the mouth of the garage. She jimmied a black lever on one side and tried the starter rope again. The saw came to life with a deafening rumble. Cardia had been a vegetarian for eight years, so the extent of her experience with chopping flesh was limited. By the time she'd finished a violent vertical dismemberment of the stout man, she was so thoroughly covered in blood that she did not imagine the second creature's vivisection could be any worse. It was coming for her, the female, and though Cardia almost slipped in the lake of blood that covered the two-car garage from wall to wall, she was ready for it. You're a little taller than Chuckles over there, so this could take a while, Cardia told the demon thing. Cardia missed the creature's hellish reply under the unforgiving tremors of the chainsaw. Headlights announced the approach of a vehicle. Drenched from head to foot with an unfathomable amount of blood, Cardia was not curious as to the identity of the driver until the car passed the entrance to No Button Pond Road and started down the driveway. Wiping a film of blood from around her eyes, she was surprised to see Kit's Volkswagen nearing the carnage. When the car turned and illuminated the blood-covered specter that was Cardia, Kit threw the car in park and was at her side in seconds. 
What the hell? What? Where is that? His hands grasped her shoulders and he surveyed her wildly, looking for a wound. Oh, it's okay, honey. It's not my blood, Cardia told him. She gestured behind her where four halves equal two bodies. Kit's jaw dropped. I'll explain, but I think we should call the police. They, they took some sort of recreational drug that was... <laughs> far from recreational. It infected them with something that uh, yeah, turned them into zombies or... Uh, <clears throat> or, um, deadites. She said these last words as if, despite the very concrete evidence of chaos behind her, Kit would think she'd lost her mind at the mention of the purportedly fictional Walking Dead. I, 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 I can't believe this. I'm so glad you're all right. I pulled into the lot at work and thought, what the hell am I doing? The night after the holiday, the night our friends get robbed. Oh, I shouldn't have left you. I should have been here for you. So I called in sick and came home. Oh, you should have called me, Cardia. No, 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 you should have called the police right away. Moved past the point of revulsion at Cardia's blood-saturated state, Kit pulled her into a savage embrace. She let him hug her, still a bit shell-shocked, and then stepped back, taking it all in. The gore packed into her jeep's tire treads winked in the moonlight. The dismembered bodies glistened in wide pools of blood near the still purring chainsaw. The pile of syringes and infected water sat in the foreground of the house's smashed windows. The house itself resembled a looming skull with its two front teeth knocked out. There was no time to call anyone. I didn't have much in the way of options. I didn't have time to come up with a plan. I had to rely on myself, I guess. With a little inspiration from a certain groovy guy. She paused, wiped a smear of blood from her cheek and continued. The important thing is that I did what needed to be done. And that I'm okay. And you're home now. So... So come here and give me some sugar, baby. Thanks for joining me tonight at the Horror Hill. The Most Important Miracle was written by Scott Emerson. The Most Important Miracle first appeared in Diner Stories Off the Menu and was later featured in Year's Best Hardcore Horror, Volume 1. Scott Emerson's fiction and poetry can also be found in Horror Sleaze Trash, Quick Shivers About Bugs, Destroy All Robots! Exclamation point, Westward Hose, and The Big Book of Bizarro. He lives in Pennsylvania. The Girl Who Loved Bruce Campbell was written by Krista Carmen. Krista Carmen's work has been featured in a myriad of anthologies, e-zines, and podcasts, including Unnerving Magazine, Fireside Fiction, The Year's Best Hardcore Horror, Volume 2, Tales to Terrify, Third Flatiron's Strange Beasties, and Albin Lake's Only the Lonely. Outpost 28, Issue 2, is available now from Elvalon Press, featuring Krista's short story, Three Cheers for Sweet Revenge, and her debut collection, Something Borrowed, Something Blood-Soaked, will be available in August 2018 from Unnerving. Something Borrowed, Something Blood-Soaked consists of 13 tales within the realm of horror and dark speculative fiction. A young mother abandons her miserable life to walk up a mysterious staircase in the woods. A bride-to-be comes to wish that the door between the physical and spiritual worlds had stayed shut on All Hallows' Eve. A lone passenger on a midnight train finds that the engineer has rerouted them toward a past she'd prefer to forget. 
Visit www.kristacarman.com for more details and to check out Krista's additional forthcoming fiction in Outpost 28, Issue 3, and Quantum Corsets, her Dark Voice, Volume 2. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Horror Hill, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted, and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Jason Hill. Additional performers have been featured when necessary to bring the tales to life. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respected authors. Sound design, original music, and final mixing and mastering provided by Luke Hodgkinson under the guidance of executive producer and director Craig Groshek. The program's artwork and logo by Jason Hill. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at horrorhill at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of the show. If you enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, Subscribe to us to be sure that you never miss an episode. And please, leave us a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and Horror Hill on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every Thursday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button too to tell us how we're doing. Oh, and if you could, please leave a kind word or even a request. If you can never get enough spooky stories and can't wait until next week for more and haven't already, be sure to check out Chilling Tales for Dark Nights on YouTube for more than 500 free audio horror stories, including more performance from yours truly, and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Thursday with more frightening fiction to haunt your dreams. Until next time. This is Jason Hill. Good evening.